Netflix just dropped the first trailer for their live action Avatar The Last Airbender series and simply put, it exceeded expectations. This show is looking like an absolute banger and I'm so glad that everyone else's hype finally matches my own. I have literally gone frame by frame through this trailer and I've found over 60 hidden details and easter eggs that you probably missed no matter how many times you've rewatched these glorious 90 seconds. The show is coming out in February but trust me, I've been following its production for years now and I guarantee that even the biggest Avatar fans are about to double their knowledge by watching through this video. Let's dive in. Time. Time is a funny thing. The past. The trailer opens with Sozin's comet streaking across the sky above what looks like the Fire Nation's capital city. If you turn up the brightness, you can make out these jagged ridges in the background which seem to match the rim of the volcano's caldera. If you think about it, the entire show is confined by this comet. Its power to strengthen the firebenders is what fueled the airbender genocide, launching the Hundred Year War. A war that we of course know only ended during the season finale with the comet's return. So it being the opening shot of both this trailer and probably the first episode 2 is a smart narrative of choice. Speaking of the air nomad genocide, this next scene depicts it, with this battle between the air and firebenders taking place in what is probably the southern air temple, judging by the mountaintop landscape. The voiceover you hear throughout the teaser is Monk Gyatso's, played by Lim K. Su. We see the first fighters clash right when he says the past, because these scenes all took place 99 years before the main narrative starts. And this is actually the very first time that the genocide has ever been shown on screen. It was repeatedly referenced in the original cartoon, but we never actually witnessed it, probably because of Nickelodeon. Avatar's creators have said that they weren't even allowed to show characters punching each other on screen, so animating a massacre was definitely off the table. Paul Sung Hyung Lee, the new actor for Iroh, has said that this live action will be more mature than the cartoon while still keeping the heart of the OG series. Currently, the Netflix page lists Avatar's genre as kids, so it's not like things are going to get too intense here. I'd guess that the rating will be TVPG. It's not going to be like Stranger Things, with kids randomly cursing up a storm, but they're definitely will be enough fantasy violence to put it above the typical children's rating of TVY7. The coolest detail from these opening shots are these 10 figures right here. You can see that they are actually people using firebending to fly through the sky. It's most obvious for these figures at the front who start ripening up as they prepare for the landing. This is incredible, partly because it addresses one of the earliest unanswered questions from the show. You don't understand Katara, the only way to get to an airbender temple is on a flying bison and I doubt the Fire Nation has any flying bison. So how did the Fire Nation reach those remote locations quickly enough to execute an instantaneous purge? It was never actually explained, but one of the more widely accepted fan theories speculates that the comet's power boost temporarily unlocked flight for the most elite firebenders, allowing them to launch the surprise attack. Still in the battle shot, we do see some soldiers with swords, seemingly non-benders who must have just hiked up the mountain. After all, there is a rope bridge right here. Logically expanding on the Four Nations lore and showing previously unexplored moments like this one are what make me the most excited about this adaptation. Netflix will make small changes that, believe it or not, might wind up improving the story all while remaining faithful to the cartoon we know and love. For instance, we know that Fire Lord Sozin has already been cast, which is really weird because technically he's not supposed to show up until near the end of season 3. So why is Netflix jumping the gun? Well, we know Fire Lords aren't often sedentary. They are warrior kings who love a good fight. So Sozin should probably be present at this battle, and I think he'll be leading the onslaught from atop his dragon. Netflix needs this show to prove itself as quickly as possible, all while standing out from the original. If I'm right about this being the opening scene, then imagine how cold it would be seeing an initial struggle followed by a giant blue dragon just torching the entire temple. Now that would be a tone setter, and it would keep both new and old viewers invested. Remember, it's not supposed to be a fair battle with monks holding their own against trained Fire Nation killers. No, the whole screen will be bathed in flames by the end of this, similar to another show actually. Netflix execs have said that they want this adaptation to be like an Asian American Game of Thrones, and then they went and hired a Dean Egg, which is the exact same VFX company that brought the Westeros dragons to life. Just consider the possibilities. The future. 
The voiceover mentions the future right when we see Aang's iceberg. In the first few episodes of the cartoon especially, a lot of Aang's early character development focused on him reckoning with the loss of his former life. So despite this speech alluding to present events from Monkey Yatso's POV, Aang wakes up in a distant future in a different world. We get a glimpse of Gowan Dio as Katara. She looks great, hair loopies and all, but her necklace is a bit different. The water bending designer looks the same, but it appears to have been carved into a bone based material. I think for the indigenous inspired water tribes, that actually fits a lot better than whatever the glassy, blue, gem like material was in the cartoon. Next is Sokka, played by Ian Ousley, and here I'll bring up one of the most controversial decisions they made with the cast. And it's kind of obvious too. Something is just completely off about these two actors in particular. It's the color of their eyes. Yeah, so for the live action series, they decided not to give any of the actors colored contact lenses. That's a pretty significant change, especially since eye color is often a notable cultural indicator within the Four Nations. Water tribers usually have blue eyes, the Earth Kingdomites green, and the Fire Panese have like amber ones. Also, I guess the Aeromatos have gray, but that's based on a sample size of just one. Blue eyes are a very European trait, so the series opted not to include them as Netflix's goal is to showcase the beauty of Asian and indigenous cultures. And those demographics overwhelmingly have brown eyes. Sounds fair to me. It all gets mixed up. Before panning up to the city, we see at the bottom of the screen what looks like Momo riding on someone's head. And the person is kind of hunched over in this weird bent knee stance too. This has to be Aang in his ingenious disguise. Name's Bonzu! Pippin Petal loves the Cubbalus! Inclusions like this reassure me that yes, while the show will be more mature, a lot of the more comedic moments or even ridiculous ones still made the cut. The three-tiered earthbent gate opens in almost the exact same way as it did in the cartoon. And then, another blinking miss at easter egg, that right there is 100% the cabbage man with his cabbage cart. <laughs> Them having the sheer audacity to hide this in the middle of their very first trailer lets us know that the running gag is alive and well. In this gorgeous shot of Amashu, we actually see a package moving against gravity as someone must be earthbending it upwards in the slide delivery system. Here Dallas Liu's Zuko seems to be wearing his sword's sheaths, but I don't actually see the handles. Maybe they're on display on his quarter's walls? Hard to say. Look at how this soldier bows. He's using the proper Fire Nation technique with a closed fist under an open hand. We we first saw Aang learn the sign of respect back in the cartoon's third season when a Fire Nation school teacher corrected his form. Aang also later bowed to Zuko when accepting him as his firebending Shifu. I can't tell when this scene is supposed to take place, but I think it might be a new scene entirely. The Avatar live action will have 8 episodes that are 1 hour each, equaling a total runtime of 480 minutes. Coincidentally, that is the exact same runtime as the cartoon's first season, which had 20 episodes of about 24 minutes each. With the advantage of hindsight, Netflix will likely skip over some of the lesser loved filler episodes like The Great Divide, meaning there could be up to an hour of freed up runtime where they could add in new and interesting subplots. You know, researching this video got me thinking about just how much of our private lives are available online. Sure, these actors are much more public figures than you and I, but our information is out there too because large data and marketing companies all make a profit by collecting our personal info and selling it to the highest bidder without our consent. That's where Incogni comes in, the sponsor of today's video. Incogni is a service that tracks down the third parties holding your data hostage and gets it deleted. In a super simple one-click process, I could see exactly how many data brokers had my information. And then in real time, I watched as Incogni started reaching out on my behalf to get those databases scrubbed clean. Doing this manually would have taken me months and I wouldn't even know where to start. By using Incogni, I'm also cutting out annoyances from my life. I receive fewer spam calls and less junk mail like those quote-unquote free credit cards and I'm prompted loan offers from predatory financial institutions. So get this, the first 100 people to go to incogni.com slash babylionturtle or who use the code babylionturtle at checkout will get a whopping 60% off their incogni plans. Remember, that's incogni.com slash babylionturtle for 60% off, link below. We finally get a decent look at Zuko's scar, and honestly, I still think it's mid, although I'm not as peeved as I was before. I think what initially threw me wasn't a size problem, but rather that his eyebrow is still fully in 
intact. The cartoon character's lack of an eyebrow really emphasizes the scar's prominence and underscores it as a constant source of embarrassment and a permanent hindrance to Zuko's life, so I think it definitely would have been worth it to hide the eyebrow with thicker makeup, but oh well. Here's Paul Sung Kyung Lee's Uncle Iroh, go to casting by the way, and fun fact, he's best known for starring in Kim's Convenience where he played a store clerk named Appa. We'll get to the OG furball by the end of this video though, don't worry. There's only one way. This shot is almost a one-to-one -one recreation of the opening scene from the Blue Spirit episode. Next is Ozai's throne room, where they appear to have borrowed some design elements from Sozin's throne room, like this elaborate golden dragon wall decoration that's peeking out over the flames. This throne room also has an actual throne in it, comprised of two more spiraling dragons on either side. In the cartoon, the Fire Lord and his heirs were always shown sitting down on the floor, a practice that is much more common in Eastern cultures. Still, I did some digging, and apparently the real-life Emperor of Japan does have a royal seat called the Chrysanthemum Throne. By the way, did y'all know that Japan still has an emperor and that they're the longest running royal family in the world? Because I sure didn't. And on that note, feel free to press subscribe if you've learned anything new or if you appreciate the lengths that I've gone through to dissect this trailer. There's a lot more coming, and even though I'm rarely the first channel to upload whenever a big development drops like this, I try to make up for it by always delivering the best and most informative Avatar videos possible. Here's Daniel Day Kim looking immaculate as the big baddie Fire Daddy Ozai, probably my favorite casting. The original cartoon went out of its way to avoid showing Ozai's face up until the final season, but they're taking a different approach here because apparently, according to several insiders, they realize that it's just physically impossible to hide Daniel Day Kim's cheekbones. You keep it straight. Mary Jong's Suki's Kiyoshi's Warrior's makeup is almost spot on, but they added a little flourish with this golden gleam at the corner of her eyes. This addition could have been made to help the audience keep track of which warrior is the leader, but I think it could also just be a way of making her makeup look more cinematic. Real life cosplayers perfected this makeup style decades ago, but now with this slight augmentation, this official Netflix rendition feels a bit more unique. I bet you didn't notice that Suki's golden headpiece depicts two closed fans crisscrossing over her forehead. This this contrast with the more open fan design in the original. This next scene reveals that we'll get to see Suki without her makeup, which is a notable change. Suki from the cartoon was never meant to be a reoccurring character, she only became one once Avatar's creators saw how popular she'd become. So in Suki's first appearances, we exclusively saw her in full warrior mode, covered in makeup in every scene. It wasn't until the middle of season 2, halfway through the series, that they actually animated her face. This is another instance where the live action could completely one-up the original just by including more of a fan favorite character. Again, Suki was only present for like 20 minutes in the cartoon's first season, but here she'll get at least an hour long episode, so expect a decent amount of additions surrounding her character. In the same silhouette shot, we can see that Sokka is also wearing Kyoshi Warrior attire. Warning, wokeness detected. Netflix is trying to indoctrinate our kids with this cross dress and gender politics bullshit. Go woke, go broke, fuck around and find out, brother. <coughs> The wider dojo shot confirms that the Four Nations in-universe writing will still take the form of Chinese characters like in the cartoon. Heck if I know what this says though, and Google Photos Translate wasn't cutting it either. You can kinda make out this small green Kyoshi statue in the background, probably part of a shrine. Now to the warriors themselves, they look fantastic and I appreciate how the bronze plating over their robes actually looks like effective armor. Next, let's zoom in and meticulously overanalyze their feet. The live action warriors are wearing these toe socks, called tabi, which are traditionally worn in Japan during formal occasions. In the cartoon, both the warriors and Kyoshi were only ever shown with big combat boots. We learn in the canon Kyoshi novels that her iconic green kimono was a gift from her earthbending master, Janju. You see, Janju was a wealthy diplomat, and Kyoshi, who grew up a poor orphan, didn't have anything nice to wear when meeting with other heads of state as the Avatar. Since the live-action Netflix show will spend so much extra time on Kyoshi Island, don't be surprised if some of the new lore introduced in the novels appears on screen for the the first time. If you haven't read the Kyoshi novels yet, then I highly recommend you change that before the show comes out. By going to kiyoshibooks.com, you can get one free audiobook to keep forever and use Audible for free for 30 days. They have basically every title that you can think of, and if you already have Amazon Prime, then you can actually get two free books to keep forever. Once again, kiyoshibooks.com. Read something for free, support me, win-win. Always remember who you are. Oh. 
here we see Aang gliding towards the Crescent Island volcano alone when normally he'd be riding Appa alongside his friends. I feel like this might be a trailer shot that's not in the actual show, mainly because Aang typically can't fly across the entire ocean with his glider, but I guess it's also possible that they shuffled around the events of the Winter Solstice episodes. Love the way Aang looks here, he's played by Gordon Cormier. If you look at this carriage and the scenery behind him, it seems like this moment will take place in the streets of Omashu. I would guess that the huge dust cloud Aang's airbending away must have been kicked up by an earthbender, probably King Boombi based on the setting, in a scene where the avatar is forced to reveal himself. Most people's biggest concern with this adaptation centers on Avatar's creators Mike and Brian leaving the project in 2020 due to quote creative differences. So many fans act like that's a death blow to the series, but I was never so sure. Because like, George Lucas invented Jar Jar Binks and Breck created Unavatu. No artist is infallible. Still, soon after Mike and Brian left, the pair joined Avatar Studios where they're currently working on a sleuth of new animated Avatar content. However, and although everyone's keeping it on the down low, Avatar Studios is still one of the production companies that's helping Netflix make this live action series a reality. And it doesn't stop there. We also know from some inside scoopers, real ones this time, that Avatar Studios is sharing its franchise resources, lore books, and production schedules behind the scenes. All that to say, these two companies are working together to ensure this adaptation is cohesive with the wider franchise. Avatar Studios, so by extension Mike and Brian would love for this series to succeed as it's in a unique position to introduce new audiences to the franchise in the same way that the One Piece live action did for its source material. For the live action Avatar soundtrack, Netflix booked the composer Takeshi Fukawa. He's most famous for doing the music in Star Wars The Clone Wars, which is fantastic news for us. As a Star Wars veteran, Takeshi had to learn the niche skill set of putting a modern touch on fantasy music all while sampling motifs and paying homage to iconic soundtracks. It's a delicate balance of enhancing the old with some new flourishes. Judging from the music in this trailer, I think we're in good hands. Now listen closely because this next easter egg is probably my favorite. Water. Earth. Fire. Air. Hidden throughout this trailer, almost in plain sight, are the iconic opening four beats that start off every episode of the cartoon. You can't drop in references like that without being an authentic Avatar fan. The people behind this show are really trying to give us something special, and I for one appreciate it. Lots to break down this time. Okay, so this is obviously a recreation of Heibai's forest, and let's take a moment to appreciate the scenery here. These trees you see in the distance aren't there at all. That's actually the volume, a cutting edge green screen replacement technology where the walls of a giant room are covered in LED screens. This tech is used in all these Star Wars shows, like The Mandalorian, and is also in some of the most beautiful blockbusters, like The Batman. Netflix's Avatar was filmed on the largest volume stage in the world, really demonstrating how the studio spared no expense when recreating these fantasy locations. For those paying attention, you can see that Ozai's bracelets have a little Fire Nation insignia on them. Nice touch. And this is clearly the infamous duel between the Fire Lord and his son, where Zuko first received his scar. In the cartoon, the camera panned away, opting not to show the moment where Zuko got burned. That was likely to appease Nickelodeon censors, but it seems like Netflix won't be glossing over the brutal details. Interestingly, we see that Zuko briefly defends himself, cutting through Ozai's fire blast. Although we never saw the animated version of this moment, we know that what pissed Ozai off the most was that Zuko refused to fight back. Most fans took that to mean that Zuko just kept bowing while his father attacked, but we don't actually know. It's an equally valid interpretation to think that Zuko only defended himself and that Ozai got pissed by his lack of offense. That seems to be what Netflix is going for at least. There are several fun references on this wall. Here's a cartoon accurate sketch of Avatar Yang Chen, and also one of Aang. This seems to be Zuko's sort of obsessed conspiracy wall. He's probably trying to get into Aang's mindset by studying up on his airbending predecessor. This map of the Four Nations also looks pretty pretty one to one with the cartoon, and then for some reason there's this drawing of the Fire Nation Capital Island. You can barely make out the zigzagging path up the volcano along with the Royal Plaza Tower and the Fire Lord's Harbor. I think Zuko just misses home. Iroh's face looks super red here, maybe because he just got out of a hot tub? If that's the case, then this could be the live action version of the iconic naked Iroh fighting scene. But like, his face is so red. It honestly looks much more akin to the time when he drank poisonous tea. That isn't supposed to happen until season 2 though, when the pair is extremely desperate and on 
the run, but once again, things could move around. Zuko shows off his bending with his dynamic jump kick fire move, and for those who are unfamiliar with this actor, Dallas Liu is basically a real life ninja. This is a video of him as a kid when he was a champion karate and tricking mini celebrity. So I wouldn't be surprised if Dallas has a lot of his own stunts, or if the live action Zuko is a much more acrobatic fighter as a result. Finally, something about this rock is off. I think like it's lighting, it doesn't match the surrounding environment, so I'm about 87.2% sure that it landed here after being earthbent. This thing probably barely missed Zuko, which explains why the prince is out here retaliating so fiercely. This clip is one single second long, and Lizzie Yu already looks murderous as Azula. We know Azula's role has been expanded in the live action, but I think this clip might be from a flashback scene. I don't know, Azula just looks slightly younger here to me, and she's not wearing her armor like in that poorly staged promo photo released before the trailer. I feel like this is a look at Azula from around the time when Zuko got scarred. Maybe this is the last time the princess sees her brother right before Zuko's banishment. Also, in the background of that promo photo I mentioned, you can just barely make out two figures respectively clad in black and pink. That's Mei and Tai Li, who we also know will be doing who knows what in this first season. I think this could be the same cave from the storm, which was one of Avatar's most pivotal early info dump episodes. In it, the audience finally learns about Aang and Zuko's backstories and can appreciate how similar the two characters are despite them being on very different paths. Sokka's role in that episode though is basically insignificant as he gets tangled up in some useless b-plot about fishing. So Katara, who finds Aang sulking in this cave, is the only one around to hear his backstory. For such a big character moment, Sokka also being present makes some sense. I love 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 the way Aang's arrow gradually glows up, highlighting the inner designs before radiating pure energy. Judging by the background, Aang's calm demeanor, and the closed eyes, I think this is him meditating into the spirit world while in the North Pole. Next we see Fire Nation soldiers ransacking Kiyoshi Island before everyone is yeeted back by a huge airbending blast. Now I'm seeing a lot of online discussion assuming that this is Aang in the Avatar state. But if you pause, zoom, and enhance, it actually looks like this figure is wearing green and gold, which are Avatar Kiyoshi's colors. Now, of course, this could still be Aang in Kiyoshi's makeup, but once again, we know that Netflix has already cast Kiyoshi, despite that character only ever appearing as a statue until season 2 of the cartoon. I think what we're witnessing is Kiyoshi manifesting herself through Aang's body, specifically so that she can lay her hands on these people who are destroying her home. Kiyoshi does something similar in the cartoon's second season, but that awesome moment was buried near the the end of a kind of fillery whatever episode. So if Netflix is looking ahead, they probably realize they could retrofit that concept here, skipping over the rest. And having a new early season after Kiyoshi beatdown, I doubt fans will complain much. We get a pretty good look at these guys' helmets, and while they're much scolier and scarier than I expected, they still match the cartoon. Alright, we're nearing the final stretch. Love this classic shot of Team Avatar getting away on Appa at the last minute. You can make out Aang pulling Katara into the saddle, working that courtesy Riz. Meanwhile, Sokka is at the reins, which was a rare sight in the first season. I think this scene must be from the Jet episode, where we first see Sokka taking on more of a leadership role. I'm also tipped off by this orange foliage in the background. After all, Jet's forest was fully bathing in the Christian girl autumn vibes. The music swells in the final seconds of this teaser. A large part of what makes it feel so tangible here is that the entire Netflix Avatar soundtrack was performed by a live orchestra and choir on the Synchron stage in Vienna, Italy. That's the same recording facility that produced most of the MCU stuff, along with like Harry Potter and those BBC Planet documentaries. In the original cartoon, only the series finale episode had a live orchestra, so by having an even better setup from the very beginning, Netflix is spoiling our ears. In this clip, we watch as the gang leaves the Southern Air Temple moments after Aang was confronted with the death of his people. That's why Katara tries to cheer up Aang by pointing out that Momo has followed them. And it works, which is kinda crazy, like sorry you just learned your entire race was genocided, but here's a cute puppy. We hear Momo purring over the background music, and yeah, it's cute as hell. In the cartoon, all of the hybrid animals, including both Appa and Momo, were voiced by a real human, the prolific voice actor Dee Bradley Baker. <laughs> If I had to choose a favorite character to do, it's probably gonna be Momo. Following the trailer's release, D confirmed that he was not part of this project, which is unfortunate since his talents are pretty singular. I don't know how Netflix might have replaced him. It could be another insanely skilled actor, but I'm leaning towards a less artistic approach where they maybe just took animal noises and blended them together. Momo's purrs might just be a pitch alter to Cat, but it works.
Speaking of Momo, did you catch him turn towards the camera and give us a big ol' yawn? So cute. They're obviously heading towards Kiyoshi Island, which I expertly deduced by looking at this giant Kiyoshi statue in the middle of the screen. Crazy that for some YouTubers, pointing out stuff like this counts as a full breakdown. Anyway, we see that the gang is staring across the horizon, so they obviously see the giant statue too. That's another change. In the cartoon, Aang went to Kiyoshi Island not for any plot-related reasons, but solely because he wanted to ride a giant fish. It just so happened that the giant fish were located on Kiyoshi Island, allowing the gang to run into Suki and learn about the past Avatar. So the first time they pulled up to the island, they just saw mountains. The cartoon statue was much smaller and hidden from bird's eye view. So why make this change? Well, once again, I think several new events will take place on this island, and I think the gang will have a much more story-driven reason to visit. In fact, I bet Netflix just removed the fish stuff entirely. Even for a cartoon, those scenes in particular always felt extra cartoony. Like, how would you go about translating this monstrosity to live action? Rather than all that, I think the gang is coming to this island with the specific goal of learning more about Avatar's stuff. We didn't originally get the Avatar stuff talk until Season 2. In Season 1, the Avatar state didn't even have a name yet, and the rule about dying in the Avatar state hadn't been established either. I think using Kyoshi and her expanded backstory, KyoshiBooks.com, to introduce all that stuff a bit earlier makes a decent amount of sense. And I know I've said that a lot in this video, but I swear I'm not simping. Netflix's changes just objectively aren't that bad. For some reason, they never actually showed Appa's face in the teaser, though I guess they simply forgot because they quickly shared this wider view promo photo of him. Thumbs up, he looks like a big chunky cow. The trailer ends by flashing through the elemental symbols from the cartoon. Is it just me or does the earth bidding symbol look like his resolution is way lower than the others? We see the new live action avatar logo on this banner flag thing and the FedEx-esque detail of the hidden arrow wedged between the words air and bender was an inspired choice. The font for the word avatar is the same though, or well technically it's not a font at all since it was actually hand painted by avatar's Chinese calligraphy expert Dr. Su Leung Li. Finally, they reveal the release date, February 22nd, 2024, and surprisingly, even this date is an easter egg. The last one I found in fact, number 69. Nice. The original Avatar The Last Airbender cartoon first aired on Nickelodeon on February 21st, 2005. So exactly 19 years later, OG fans would get to experience the first true live-action adaptation ever attempted for this franchise, and then hopefully this time, the big release will be followed by bouts of thunderous applause. Please share this video with other Avatar fans, and subscribe if you enjoyed the trailer breakdown. Also, if you were shocked by how good the footage looks or how many easter eggs were included, then that just means you didn't watch this video from a few months ago when I exposed the true scale of Netflix's Avatar live action and broke down its insane production details and secrets. Do yourself a favor and check it out now, it's more relevant than ever. Comment below if I missed anything, or let me know which moment from Avatar's teaser trailer was your personal favorite.